To begin again, um, you're all very, very welcome to this uh, Oclu event. We're delighted to have Luke Hester Miller um, here in, in week three to speak to us about her recent work on um, on John Keats and kind of telling the life through the, through the letters. Um, most of you know me, but as it is the start of a new year, um, I will introduce myself. I'm Elika Burma. I'm the co-director here of the Oxford Centre for Life Writing based at Wolfson. And it's my great pleasure now to introduce uh, this evening's speaker, uh, Lucasta Miller, um, who is returning to, uh, to Wolfson and to the Life Writing Centre um, having visited in 2016 and 2019, having been a, a, a visitor with us at the Life Writing Center in 2016. And she's going to talk about uh, and around her wonderful new book on, if I may, Lucasta, on John Keats, uh, A Brief Life in Nine Poems and One Epitaph. In 2016, uh, when, and you know what, I'm going to just pause for a minute and pop these on because it is very it is a bit dense. Um, <laughs> In 2016, when uh, Lucasta was here, she was working on her historical and literary biography of L.E.L., her full title, The Lost Life and Scandalous Death of Le Letitia Elizabeth Landon, the celebrated female Byron. And she treated us then and in, in an expanded way in 2019 to a short talk and then to a fuller presentation about that book. Lucasta has been working in life writing and reflecting on life writing for some considerable time. In her insightful <coughs> book of 2001, The Bronte Myth, she, she used the Bronte stories as a test case for examining how life stories are processed and appropriated and changed through time. And this work has been helpful for all of our work in biography and life writing and memoir and autofiction since. Yeah. How much of that would you like me to recycle? Okay, okay. Um, the Bronte myth, uh, to recap, told the story about the, how the posthumous lives of the Bronte sisters in literary criticism, in biography, and other media took shape. As also in this new Keats book and in the LEL book, This, <laughs> but there's no happy me medium, right? Right, close. Okay, as in the Keats book and in the LEL book, this is this is kind of a learning curve for you too, Lucasta. This is guys. Is this one working? Yeah, <laughs> Lucasta is an expert on the way in which myths and legends, posthumous lives and reputations contribute to our perceptions of literary culture, and in this brilliant new book on Keats. She tells of his short but vibrant life through a close reading of, as in the title, Nine Poems or One Epitaph. The book continues and amplifies Lucasta's remarkable work in looking at how biographies are processed through literary writing and how the writing in turn feeds into biography. I hope you all join with me in warmly welcoming Lucasta to give this talk on her new book here at the Oxford Centre for Life Writing. I'm really sorry about the or oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me. Hello. Well, thank you very much, Elika, um, um, for that very nice introduction. It's wonderful to be back here. Um, I think, yes, I think, as you said, it was in 2019, um, just before the pandemic, um, that I came here to give the Wine Reeb Lecture, which did touch on my book about Letitia Landon, but I do remember when I was asked to give it, um, I was asked for a brief, and, this, and what, what is my topic? And the answer just came back, life writing, full stop. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, this was really quite it, quite wonderful for me because I'd never really sort of properly looked at the different ways in which, over the long course of my career, I'd explored different types of life writing. Sorry, is this microphone... Is this OK, or is it...? If it OK. 
Well, I think that might compromise my natural performance. Um, yeah, well, um, yeah, so, um, and really, uh, I mean, apart from the, the, the three books you've mentioned, I also um, worked for quite a while as a profile writer on The Guardian. So I was writing, you know, that, that was a form of life writing of, of living individuals that I was, um, that I was, that I was interviewing. The three books I've written are all so incredibly different. As you say, The Bronte Myth um, was a study in posthumous reputation. Um, Eliel was, in some ways, more of a conventional biography. And now in the Keats book, I've done something rather different again. Um, I do think that possibly it's because I haven't yet learned how to write a biography, and it's, it's as if I have to reinvent the wheel every time. This new book on Keats, um, which came out in 2021, in the, in the 200th anniversary of his death, I'm terribly sorry, I'm going to stop again to see whether or not this is working, because... It, could I ask, if, if it isn't, could somebody put their hand up, and then I can relax and know that, um, that if I'm booming unpleasantly or if I'm silent... OK, thank you. Yeah, so there's a real contrast to my to my last book, which was um, on this extremely marginal figure, um, Letitia Elizabeth Landon, at least marginal to us today, although she was extremely well known in her lifetime. Um, and trying to recover her story involved an enormous amount of sort of forensic work in the records simply to sort of establish the facts. It turned out that there had been a quite calculated cover-up about her by the Victorian establishment, um, about her suicide and about her sexual exploitation by an editor. So, when I came to Keats, it was the most sort of wonderful, in one sense, um, contrast. Firstly, Letitia Landon was a poet with an incredibly trammeled voice. Um, with Keats, I mean... I'm going to talk a bit later about um, um, about what it's like to approach such a canonical writer, having approached such a marginal one. But the just the incredible pleasure of living with Keats's poetry. All I can say is that you know, whatever one thinks of the idea of canonization, Keats has to be in that canon. Um, approaching him has really quite um, <laughs> made me feel quite sort of overwhelmed in some senses because, of course, I couldn't have chosen somebody who'd been more written about. I mean, I think I counted at least 20 biographical works on him in the last 100 years, many of, many of which are real landmark major lives, um, from Amy Lowell in the 1920s through to Nicholas Rose, um, quite sort of monumental um, Keats' A New Life that was published in 2013. So how was I going to approach Keats? I felt that, you know, I didn't I didn't really feel that I could in any way sort of compete with Keats scholars who had spent, you know, decades of their lives devoted to Keats. I also felt incredibly grateful and it gave me a wonderful sense of being sort of held up that I could study a subject um, where the, 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 the generous work of former scholars allowed me not to have to worry about the texts and where I felt that the, the basic building blocks of the life, the facts, that was all pretty much in place. What I was trying to do was something very different and what... <laughs> It really made me think about, and what I'd like to talk about today, are things like form and voice and audience. I think, excuse me a minute. And I don't know if um, other writers in the audience, and I don't know how much they've thought about this, but I've never before written anything where I've been so aware of writing for an audience. I was very keen to be able to write about Keats in a way that would appeal to um, the general reader, not, just, not to literary specialists, although I really hope that literary specialists like it too. Um, but I had in my mind almost a, um, 
you know, an imagined idea of my ideal reader. Um, he doesn't know it, but he was my neighbour. Um, he's a he's a he's a very a doctor. He's very widely read. A lot of you know very wide cultural interests. A great lover of poetry, but he's not a literary specialist. And I wanted to find a way in which I could somehow communicate the teeming complexity, um, both of Keats's life um, and, in particular, of his work. Um, to a reader who perhaps had only come across Keats through the medium of, of anthologies. Anthologies, of course, um, you know, de totally decontextualise a poem, um, sort of disembody it in some ways. And I wanted to sort of re-embody those poems for that sort of reader. The sort of solution I came to in terms of, of the form that I was going to write this book in was one in which, I mean, I think Ellick has mentioned it already, and it sort of does what it says on the tin. It's a, a brief life in nine poems and one epitaph. I chose nine of Keats's best-known poems, um, and I printed one at the beginning of each chapter. So in a sense, what I was doing was to make my own anthology, and then use that poem as a sort of springboard or a sort of window into going into the life. And so around these nine poems, I, I organised the story of Keats's night life chronologically, and yet also with a slightly more sort of essayistic, thematic approach at the same time. I think I've also never written a book that perhaps has quite such a, a conversational voice. I think it's quite interesting that I wrote it during lockdown when actually I didn't have that many other people to talk to, when I couldn't even go to libraries. And it was as if I was really trying to, um, trying to have a conversation in my head with my imagined reader. Um, they, 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 my imagined reader became you know, much, much more vivid to me. It's, it was a, a strange, a strange period that lockdown. But one thing that I was incredibly fortunate in is that I live quite close to where in London, to where Keats lived in Hampstead, and so. I was actually able to do his walks on Hampstead Heath. I was able to, to walk along the edge of the Heath where he famously met Coleridge. I was able to go and sit on the bench at the end of Well Walk where Lee Hunt um, recalled um, finding Keats in tears, in despair, at what he felt was the failure of his, of his poetic career um, and at his, at his tormented love um, for Fanny Braun. I don't think the bench is probably the same one, but it's definitely in exactly the same place that Lee Hunt described. Um, the bench on Well Walk, the one nearest to the heath, and there still is one there. I talked a bit about how I wanted to take these poems as it were, out of the anthology and, in a sense, to sort of re-embody them by contextualising them. And that idea of um, embodiment is actually quite important to my reading of Keats in general. I actually find it quite astonishing how long-lived the cultural myth of Keats as this ethereal, um, etiolated, um, frail and, um, and, and, and rather hyper-spiritualized creature, how long that myth has lasted. I mean, of course, Keats did die young. Um, he was only 25. It was an appalling and tragic and agonizing, actually, physically, appalling death. I mean, if you read the descriptions by his friend, Joseph Seven, who was with him in Rome when Keats was dying of tuberculosis, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really quite harrowing. Um, it's 
it's funny, I was thinking today about how, um, you know, compared to other biographers, my aim in this book was not to um, discover, not to go into the archives and root out new factual material, new documentary facts. And in one sense, of course, with Keats, um, you know, you, you can feel, well, well, I mean, you know, there's never going to be a new letter by Keats that turns up by now one doesn't think but it, but actually it is amazing what new little details do keep emerging and in fact only the week before last I was um, in Rome speaking at the Keats Shelley house and I met someone there an Italian who'd been doing some research in the archives um, and he found some sort of record uh, of the fact that Keats and Seven's landlady in Rome had, had issued some complaint or, uh, about some crockery being smashed. And it, was, it seemed to be quite clear that after Keats's death, Seven just completely lost it and, you know, was smashing crockery. And in a sense, it's not surprising. You know, these are two young men only in their 20s. You know, Seven has never, you know, looked after a sick person before, let alone a friend who's dying. And that tiny little detail, you know, gave me... I didn't change my view, but it definitely gave me a tiny, a, a tiny bit more insight. So as, as I was saying, um, this idea of embodiment, quite important, the idea of Keats. Because of Keats, of course, the body is extremely significant in the, in the way in which Keats writes, the, the embodied sensual nature of his imagery is you know, quite unique and, um, and quite remarkable. I mean, you know, for example, I mean, maybe I should just let's just let's just read perhaps just a little bit from um, Ode to a Nightingale. Um, if I can find it here. Oops. Because just before you jump in, could you just could you let us know how you ordered the poems? Was it chronological or absolutely, or absolutely? As I said, yes. Yeah, so the, it is the poems are in chronological order in which they were written. But on the other hand, of course, because he died so young and most of his greatest poems were written in the course of a single year, it's not as if you could have the poems at regular intervals throughout his life. Um, I mean, perhaps, rather than, rather than starting with reading from Road to a Nightingale, I ought to just talk a little bit about exactly how I did it. And, you know, so, and what was the first poem that, um, that, I, that I picked? Um, the first poem um, was, in fact, was the much anthologized poem um, on first looking into Chapman's Homer, um, which was, in fact, the first poem that, that, that Keats... I mean, I don't know, but possibly the first really, really good poem that Keats wrote, um, the, certainly the first one to get him noticed, although, in fact, it was the, it was the second one that he, that he published. And so the reader comes to the chapter and they will have this poem they will, they, the first thing they will come across is this poem. And perhaps, perhaps shall I read it now? And then we can go under the surface of the poem um, and, 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 have a little more, and have a little more of a look into, into Keats's life. On first looking into Chapman's Homer. Much have I travelled in the realms of gold and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been, which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told. The deep-browed Homer ruled as his demean. Yet never did I breathe its pure serene till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then... Felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortez when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. <laughs> 
Now, <laughs> no, so, so that was in fact, I think well, the first poem by Keats that was anthologized in, the first, in Paul Grave's first Golden Treasury in 1848, I think. Um, and yet it's one of the poems that, you know, possibly means the least when anthologised to a lot of readers. I mean, what is, for example, Chapman's Homer? I mean, I'm sure you all know who Chap what Chapman's Homer is. But, you know, I will, you know, but I'm very aware that I might have a reader who doesn't know what Chapman's Homer was. The translation of Homer written by George Chapman, Shakespeare's contemporary. Um, um, which, of course, is, you know, hardly anybody reads Chapman now. So many more, more people read Keats. And those layers, of, those layers of reading and of culture and of reputation, I find that all very interesting. One of the wonderful things about Keats is that we know so much about the circumstances in which many of his poems were written. Um, there's that wonderful quotation from one of his letters, and I wish I had it all in my head, um, when, he, when he, he's writing to his brother, um, and he talks about how he's, you know, how the candles are burnt down, and he's sitting with his back to the fire, and he's just, you know, describes his physical position, and says, you know, what wouldn't I give to know exactly what physical position Shakespeare was sitting in when he wrote To Be or Not To Be. The wonderful thing about being a Keats biographer is that in some cases you can know, if not exactly his bodily position, certainly the circumstances in which, in which a poem was written. And that one was written in 1816, in, in fact the last week of October, so very much this time of year, just before Keats's 21st birthday. Um, and he had that evening um, gone round to um, have dinner with his friend Charles Cowden Clark, and these two young men had read a borrowed copy of Chapman's Homer. And, you know, this, this raises so many questions about, you know, what are two young men doing getting so excited about, um, you know, what by then was a sort of, you know, pr pretty vintage <laughs> volume, of, uh, uh, volume of poetry. And you really have to go into... Um, the reasons why the poetry of that period, the poetry of Shakespeare and Spencer, so appealed to Keats and his generation, that it felt that rather than going backwards in time, they were actually going, you know, they were going backwards in order to go forwards. What they didn't like, and what that poem is really about, um, because of course he says that he's often travelled in, 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 in these realms, and, in, um, you know, that wonderful geographical metaphor he uses for... Um, the imaginative space created by texts, um, but you know he's you know he he he's read Homer in translation. He's read Pope's translation, which of course was the gold standard at the time. This 18th century translation, written in rhyming couplets, and. It, we do have a record, you know, an, an, an account written by Charles Cowden Clarke, um, a, a memoir of that very evening, and exactly what he, he and Keats liked about um, the Chapman compared to the Pope. And, and, there's a, and this gives you a really, really vivid idea um, of what was going through their minds. Um, the line that they thought was most risible in Pope was, it's, it's in a bit where Odysseus um, is washed up onto the beach uh, um, half drowned. And Pope writes, from mouth and nose the briny torrent ran and lost in lassitude lay all the man. Now, <laughs> um, you, you know, all those, you know, those sort of strangely detached features, that weird circumlocution, that strange sort of abstract nature of it, and of course the be bom be bom be bom be bom be bom heroic couplet. What they loved about Chapman was that he rendered practically that whole cap, um, couplet in just a few words, the sea had soaked his heart through. And in that, and in that that wonderfully compacted metaphor in which you get the sort of physicality of being soaked to the skin, and yet, you know, he's so soaked to the skin that it's sort of gone through his skin and it's an expression of, of what he's feeling like emotionally. It was that that really appealed to Keats um, 
uh, and to his friend. So from talking about this, from putting them in this room in Clerkenwell, where Charles Cowden Clark is living, I can then take us back into Keats's education because Charles Cowden Clark was um, the son of Keats's headmaster and talk a bit about his, his, his you know, very unusual education. From that point of um, he, he, you know, unlike, um, you know, the, the other romantics of his generation, Byron and Shelley, um, he didn't go to a posh public school, he didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge, and he didn't have the standard classical education that they would have had. In some ways, however, he had a more interesting education at John Clark's Academy in Enfield. Um, he would later be attacked for... Um, for the fact that he didn't know ancient Greek in the original. Oh, he only knows Homer from Chapman. Um, and yet, although he didn't learn Greek, he was learning all sorts of other things, including an awful lot of Latin. Um, and I think it was partly this education and his friendship with Charles Cowden Clark, who was encouraging him to read the English literature of this earlier period. Um, I think that's a very, very crucial element, particularly in, in the way in which Keats creates this astonishingly original um, voice. The experiments that he makes with metaphor are, you know, really, you know, haven't really been seen, I feel, you know, practically since the days of Shakespeare. Um, he's being inspired by Shakespeare, but he's, but he's looking forward as well. Um, and another aspect um, that, you know, I will talk, I talk about once I've started with that poem. So what was Keats doing at this time? He wasn't yet a professional poet. He was a medical student. At the time he was writing that poem, he was, in fact, um, you know, working incredibly hard in a role that um, we today would regard as being more like that of a junior doctor. I mean, he was practically manning the equivalent of accident and emergency 24-7, one week in four. And yet he loves poetry so much that this is what he's going to do on his, as it were, day off. And in fact, it's not, it, it won't take very long before his love for poetry becomes so powerful that he gives up his medical career and starts to, starts to focus full-time on poetry. Um, I was talking just now about the originality of his voice, um, which is, you know, what, what, what his friend Lee Hunt called his poetical concentrations, the extraordinary way in which he sort of compacts these images together so that they sort of retain their individual sort of shape and physicality and yet they bleed into each other at the same time. Um, and, you know, a, a good example of that would, would come in Ode to a Nightingale. Um, and I... Um, you know, uh, well, perhaps I'll just I'll just quickly read the read the bit that I mean. Uh, Sorry, this, this time could you use the mic when you read the poem? Oh God, did I put it down? Yes. I'm so sorry. You I was. Just, you just hear the poem. Oh, I'm so, oh sorry. Oh no, I'm so sorry. It was a lovely reading. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm now looking. I'm now looking for the for the right. No, I think I'll be fine. I think I'll be, the problem is when you're talking into it, you can't tell how it sounds like to you. We can't tell what you're saying, which is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, well, I will... If, the, if this is good, thank, well, thank you very much for actually bringing that up. And please, can anybody else just shout as loud as you like, jump up and down and get my attention, because nothing's more, nothing is more annoying than, um, than you know, feeling that you've spoken into the void for hours and hours. <laughs> so this is good, is it? Okay. Um, yes, I'm talking about Ode to a Nightingale. And I just do remember um, one occasion on which um, a director friend of mine was putting together a, a, a show or a, a, some sort of piece uh, based around nature poetry. And I remember saying, you know, well, you know, what about Ode to a Nightingale? And they thought, 
oh no 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 we don't really want that it's 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 it, you know as if it was just too familiar too hackneyed and of course it's a poem that we've all heard of um, but what I really wanted to do was to try and you know impress upon readers how actually it's not an obvious poem I wanted to in a sense make Keats strange again um, and to remind us how he came across to his first readers Certainly, um, he was on the receiving end of a lot of extremely vituperative criticism in his lifetime. I mean, his work was called Driveling Idiocy. It was called Gross. Um, um, and, uh, you know, a lot of that was motivated um, by class and political prejudice. On the other hand, I think there are ways in which we have to listen to some of Keats's first critics, because even the sympathetic critics sometimes worried that he was being sort of too original, that they sort of couldn't quite understand what he was saying. Um, although you get Byron being extremely sarky um, um, about this about O to a Nightingale saying, oh, I can't imagine what he could possibly mean by a beaker full of the warm south. It doesn't make any sense at all, Byron in his sort of, um, uh, you know, affectedly literal-minded way. But, I mean, if we just look at that, if we just look at that stanza, how's my voice? Yes. Okay. I think the problem is partly the reading glasses and the way in which I have to have exactly the right distance between <laughs> me, the microphone, the glasses, and the book. Um, but let's read this very, very famous second stanza of Ode to a Nightingale. Oh, for a draught of vintage that had been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth tasting of flora and the country green, dance and Provencal song and sunburnt mirth. So, you know, we begin with a glass of wine, a draught of vintage that's been cooled along age in the deep delved earth. I mean, that all makes, you know, sort of literal sense. And then it's tasting of flora. Well, you know, wine could have a floral bouquet, but then this is flora with a, with a capital F. It's flora the goddess, so it's wine that's tasting like a woman, now it's tasting of the country green, and now it's tasting like a dance. So we've got a taste that, that we've, got, we've got something that, we've got a taste that becomes physical movement of the whole body. And then it also tastes of song, Provencal song, and sunburnt mirth. And then in that sunburnt mirth, you get one of those really typically Keatsian sort of paradoxes or oxymorons, the pleasure and the pain that are coming together. I mean, I won't go on um, necessarily with the whole stanza, but I just, I just want to give some sort of... I just want to invite you to think about, in a sense, how, you know, how strange that is, how it really you know, goes against expectation um, and how easy it is when a writer is quite so well known to forget, um, you know, to, to forget how, you know, how original they actually were and, and still are. Of course, one of the things that um, it, it, that I was very sort of um, that, in fact, I'd like to maybe talk to you about later, um, Elika, is the the whole business of, of approaching a canonical writer, um, the whole nature of the canon, how it's changed, how it's been sort of disrupted and expanded in all sorts of you know extremely inspiring and, and, and creative ways, and yet here with Keats, I have. A poet who, you know, apart from Shakespeare, in many ways, I can't think of an English poet who occupies um, that position. In fact, the American poet um, Robert Pinsky, um, you know, in fact, he, yeah, in fact, he wrote, um, in, in fact, in a, um, in a, re a review of my book, he, he wrote, for a certain lyrical essence of poetry written in English, Keats, in his greatest poems, surpasses every writer since Shakespeare. For poets, he embodies something central to the art, a little like what Shakespeare embodied for Keats. <laughs> 
And that I'd go with completely wholeheartedly. Um, what is a bit more complex is, you know, when we come to Keats as this, you know, the, the, this character who is seen as being as great as Shakespeare, it's difficult to forget what an outsider he was at the time he was actually writing. Um, and I was very keen to get um, readers who, you know, who'd, you know, read him at school perhaps, you know, as I said, non-specialists, um, to get back into that sort of position of being the outsider, because only by understanding that do I think can I think do I think you can understand the um, the experiments that he made with verse. I talked a little bit about um, about how. <laughs> Um, when I was writing this book in lockdown, I had a, um, a very sort of friendly idea of the ideal reader in my head. Um, a reader who... A reader who I, was, who I was talking to, who I was sharing, sharing Keats with. Um... um and on, you know, and clearly Keats did not always have a friendly reader. Um, you know, what were the things about his poetry that people didn't like? Well, um, as I said, there is all the class and and political aspects. The fact that he was associated with the radical journalist Lee Hunt um, really got him sort of pulled into the heart of the culture war that was raging at the time. In some ways, in fact, his interest, as I was talking about in, in, um, in Shakespeare, in Spencer, in these earlier poets, I think he and his contemporaries actually saw that, saw that as quite sort of political in some ways. In some ways, they felt that they were freeing the, the English language from its chains. And there was something so much more, they felt there was something so much more authentic about those writers. But another aspect of Keats that really upset people was Keats's sensuality, and particularly his treatment of, of love and of sex, um, and of physical sensuality. As I said, one of the words used to describe his... Uh, some of the phrasing in Endymion was gross. And when you think of a phrase he was using like slippery blisses to describe a woman's lips, you know, there's saliva there. It's, 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 it's very physical. And you can, you know, it, you can understand why it was felt to be so disruptive, so, so unconventional. Um, I do connect in the book this awareness of the physical body, as I said, with with the fact that he'd studied medicine. I mean, there literally is. I can't think of any other writer in English who was so closely acquainted with the human body as Keats was. I mean, when he uses a phrase like a naked brain, we know he's actually seen a naked brain in the anatomy room. So particularly with, these, with, the, with this aspect of, of, of sensuality and... And, and, and sex. Um, his critics were shocked and r revolted. I will quote you something from the British critic in June 1818. We will assure him, however, that not all the flimsy veil of words in which he would involve immoral images can atone for their impurity. Now, of course, Keats doesn't write in an sort of anatomically crude way about sex. It is it is presented under a under a metaphorical veil. But it was considered um, shocking and disruptive at the time. What um, slightly amazed me was that you know that that it's still considered um, quite problematic um, in certain ways, or at least the way in which I wrote about it. Um, it was considered quite problematic by some critics. I'm going to talk quickly now bef um, um, before we move over to questions about 
Keats's poem, The Eve of St. Agnes, the famous poem um, in which the heroine, the, the heroine um, goes to bed. It's on St. Agnes' Eve where if um, you go to bed, perform the right rituals, as it were, you will dream of your future lover or husband. And she does all this, and of course, the real life flesh and blood Porphyro creeps into the castle, um, watches her undress from behind a curtain, creeps into her bed, um, and she's still dreaming. Um, and then there's this moment of sexual consummation before she finally is fully awake and the lovers run away into the storm. Now, when I was writing about this, I pointed out that there were some slightly sort of uncomfortable elements of um, voyeurism and predatory sort of implications um, in, um, in Keats's description of this. And yet, in no way I was, um, was I describing the real Keats as being a predator. In fact, um, my whole interpretation was in the context of the fact that he'd been um, inspired to write the poem by this sophisticated woman, Mrs. Jones, that he'd been having a bit of a dalliance with. Um, and, in t and, and, you know, when he describes his meeting with Mrs. Jones in her flat, he's the one who's definitely on the back foot. He sort of leans over to kiss her because he's done this before, and when she sort of moves backwards. He's totally respectful. This poem is a fantasy, um, and I, I wasn't trying to, um, trying to draw any conclusions or make any moral judgments on, um, on Keats, the real person. But I got some people complaining that I was sort of, I was being, you know, I was sort of being woke and was accusing Keats of misogyny in a sort of knee-jerk way. Um, and it has to be said that when Keats wrote the poem, his publisher said, hang on, Keats, you can't write this. This is unpublishable. Um, it will, you know, completely alienate your women readers, um, and it's just indecent. Um, and Keats's reply was, um, you know, that only a eunuch would leave a maid a maid in such a situation, making it quite clear to me that he intends the couple actually to have sex. Now, Extraordinarily, one of, one of the critics who, in fact, wrote an otherwise incredibly generous review of my book complained that I suggested that sex was happening in this poem at all, that I'd said, well, the heroine's called Madeline and, um, you know, a Magdalene was a fallen woman and Keats', Keats is, when he was working at Guy's Hospital, it was next door to the Magdalene Hospital, which was a rescue home for fallen women and, well, actually, you know, they were having sex and this and this critic really couldn't couldn't take it and um and said um no 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 it's it's you know she remains it's not a poem about loss of virginity um it's you know um you know that sex does not happen and i find it very interesting that people still feel sort of quite discomforted by this and in particular it's the men it's the male critics who feel uncomfortable about this what I feel is that it's quite extraordinary that Keats as a young man in um in that period was so self-aware that he's he confesses I believe I have not a right feeling about women and he's actually very sort of you know self-exploratory about that and he and he connects it with the fact that um you know, he did feel he'd been abandoned by his mother as a child. After his father died when he was eight, his mother ran off with another man and he never again, he and his siblings never again lived with her as a family. He doesn't really see her again until she comes back um, to his grandparents' house um, where she then dies and he nurses her. And these very, very complex love-hate feelings that he has for women um, that you can trace through so many of his poems. I think I've, we're probably coming towards the end, but just before we do, can I end by reading my very favorite poem of Keats, um, which is La Belle Dame Sans Merci, because this is a poem in which I feel that you 
do get a glimpse of Keats's complex relationship with his mother, his complex attitude to women, but I also think it's a poem that shows that there is something so mysterious about creativity that no biographical account can ever really explain it. Um, so here we go. La Belle da sorry. La, is that was that okay? Are you okay? La Belle Dame Sans Merci, a ballad. Oh, what can ail thee night at arms, alone and palely loitering? The sedge has withered from the lake and no birds sing. Oh, what can ail thee night at arms, so haggard and so woe begone? The squirrel's granary is full, and the harvest done. I see a lily on thy brow, with anguish moist and fever dew, and on thy cheeks a fading rose fast withereth too. I met a lady in the meads, full beautiful, a fairy's child, her hair was long, her foot was light and her eyes were wild. I made a garland for her head, and bracelets too, and fragrant zone. She looked at me as she did love, and made sweet moan. I set her on my pacing steed, and nothing else saw all day long. For sidelong she would bend, and sing a fairy's song. She found me roots of relish sweet, and honey wild, and manna dew, and sure, in language strange, she said, I love thee true. She took me to her elfin grot, and there she wept and sighed full sore, and there I shut her wild, wild eyes with kisses for, and there she lulled me to sleep, and there I dreamed, ah, oh, woe betide. The latest dream I ever dreamt on the cold hill side. I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors, death pale were they all. They cried, La belle dame saw mercy thee hath in thrall. I saw their starved lips in the gloam, with horrid warning, gaped wide, and I awoke and found me here on the cold hill's side. And this is why I sojourn here alone and palely loitering. Though the sedge is withered from the lake and no birds sing. Thank you for that beautiful... Thank you for that beautiful reading, Lucasta, and, and, and for the other beautiful readings and for your thoughts and reflections on the process of writing the book. I wonder if um, perhaps I could um, grab a couple of questions for myself and then, okay, we, could, and, course, and, uh, and then we could open to, um, to, to the audience. Um, I w just kind of jumping off what you were saying just before you read the poem about um, kind of working with the poetry mm. to get to something of the life of yes. the character yes. of, uh, and the experience of Keats. Um, and, 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 and I, I wonder what you feel about that now, that, that, that process that you went through, that writing of the life through the work, whether it, because it is very different from, from the previous book, so, which was more of a straightforward 
autobiography. So, yes. so how, how, how yes. has it been to to do that to, that yeah. sifting and weaving? Well, I have yeah. to say, I just I, I I feel so incredibly lucky and privileged that I was able to do that. I mean, just to spend that time with Keats's poetry was was phenomenal um i think what i was really trying to do in the book as you can tell was to to to, to create a sort of hybrid genre of of literary criticism and biography that mm. could accommodate some very close reading um and yet i wanted to to offer these close readings um in such a in such a form that they would be accessible to people who weren't used to reading books of literary criticism um i mean i hope I, I hope I succeeded in doing that, but um, it was really crucial to me to put the writing first. I, I mean, you know, occasionally you'll read a literary biography where the, the effort to um, to reconstruct the life has to absorb so much of the biographer's, um, you know, mind space that there's less space to focus on the work. But when the writer is somebody who writes like Keats. I mean, I, 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 you know, that's why I felt mm. so lucky to be able mm. to do it. Mm. And, you've, and you've mentioned there the writing and, and going back to and reading the writing and really sort of sitting with, dwelling with the mm. writing. I was also thinking um, when you were talking about Chapman's Homer, um, whether, whether it... I mean, whether there were particular revelations that came to you through thinking about his reading, because clearly, oh. I mean, you know, you, um, you, we have that figure of you know Cortez looking, start yes. Cortez looking out at the yes. Pacific. Now that suggests to me that that Keats is also reading not only. Um, you know, translations oh, of, of yes. the Greeks, but he's also reading yes. the travel writing yes, yes. of the time. He's 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 possibly. I mean, I'm thinking of the Pacific. I'm thinking Cook. I'm thinking. You know, is it, he so? In short, his reading must have been layered and vast. Of course, he's also reading his medical textbooks, and the, mm. which are coming into yes, his imagery. Yes. So I was wondering whether that sh the new light was shed for you through me, yes. delving well, into yeah, yes i mean mm. i mean in fact the um the 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 Cortez reference um or rather i mean T tennyson pickily pointed this out a long time ago that keats made a factual error there because it wasn't in fact Cortez, but another of the conquistadors balboa who was the first european um to cross over and actually look at the pacific ocean um but Keats had read about that indeed in um, A History of America that he'd actually read at school, at this remarkable school where the curriculum was extremely broad. I mean, if you went to Harrow like Byron or, or Eton like Shelley, you got an enormous diet of, La of Latin and Greek and really not much else. At John Clark's Academy, you not only got um, history and travel, you got astronomy um, you know they, um, and you've got the you know the new planets swimming into his can in 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 Chapman's Homer. And yeah, and I, I, I was also thinking of 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 Cook because the Pacific going to to see the transit of Venus, and you know, the, the, all those concentrations are, are are coming together in in in, in Keats and. And and his I mean, his readings must have been extremely um, yeah w wide ranging as as uh, as you're saying. I have I mean I ha actually have loads of questions, but 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 I'm just going to slip in one more bit, um, before we open up. We I personally have been enormously treated in this past year by two of my favourite writers being given this treatment of the life through the work mm. Keats in in your yeah. book. And uh, Claire Hansen's uh, Catherine Mansfield, um, and and I, I I noticed that she had reviewed this this book. I think I think I'm right in saying Claire, Claire Harman, Harman. I'm sorry. Claire oh yes, Harman, Claire yes, Harman. Yes, yes. So her she 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 um, has um, I think it was published earlier this year to um, to coincide with the hundred year. Um, the centenary of mm. the death of Mansfield. Um, so, so Claire Harmon um, reads the life of Mansfield, also a short life, also cut short mm. by tuberculosis. She reads it through the stories. Um, through, you know, mm. her, I, I can't remember how many, but through her mm. kind of favourite favorite stories. Um, I mean, is this, 
This is a bit, very big question, but is this a bit of a new genre? Are we are we seeing it? Well, is, is, I, is, is, is this, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm so flattered that Claire Harmon <laughs> followed my footsteps by doing yeah. that. And well, maybe we have. Some. In fact, I noticed somebody's just advertised Byron, A Life in Ten Letters, or there something. We go. Yeah. And there was Beethoven, A Life in Nine Pieces. But I think that that might have come out even before my mm. Keats. So you know, I'm not I'm not claiming. <laughs> I'm not claiming this for myself, but I think it is a. It, it proved certainly with Keats for me an incredibly fertile and useful formula for being able to 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 share both the work and the life with a non-specialist audience. Mm, mm, mm. And on the word audience, I think we should open up to the audience. And um, yeah, but I, I'm happy to run around with this, Anna, with this, with this mic. And um, okay, sure, okay. Um, I was interested in, like, if we think about the lyric form mm. as, like, um, kind of a mode of contemplation, poetic contemplation, um, and then when you were describing, you know, the bodily vigour of, po of Keats's yeah. poetry and the way that his um, critics at the time responded in such bodily terms, like, gruesome, repulsive, vile, um, I'm wondering what you make of the tension between... Yeah, the, the lyric is that we usually think of it as this quite spiritual, transcendental form versus the very bodily, almost visceral nature of Keats's poetry. Yeah. But I mean, but I, don't you feel that perhaps, I mean, that's a really interesting question, but don't you feel that the, perhaps the thing that Keats does is to keep those two things in perpetual tension with each other, perhaps? Um, I mean, you know, we. we <laughs> Is the nightingale a real bird, or is it in the imagination? Are we talking about the real physical world, or are we talking about something that's more abstracted and physical? I think these are sort of these are questions that are going on all the time um, in Keats. It's interesting, though, what you say about the about that sort of grittiness and um, uh, you know the, the aspect of his work that that, that his um, his contemporaries found quite rebarbative um, or at least some of his contemporaries and I you know I'd be really interested to ask this audience you know what what what's your idea of the popular conception of Keats I mean I've, I've had so many sort of anecdotal sort of examples of people still having this rather sort of as I said etherealized idea an idea that goes all the way back to Shelley's um, elegy at a nice but I'd love any comments about um, you know popular perceptions of Keats Thank you, John. Can you hear me? Now you can. I. Well, I find okay. Um, on that last point, I mean, as you rightly say, Bright Star, the Campion film, is a kind of cliche. Actually, I think it's a rather better film than you do, but nevertheless, <laughs> it's perfectly true that what you present is a much more complicated Keats mm. than is presented there and also one who suffers from depression, anxiety, and so on. Uh, however, that was not really what I was going to uh, comment on. I was really interested in the structure that mm. you have, and I particularly like the way in which... This, I mean, at the beginning you say, this is a, you're writing as a reader to other readers. Mm. So I like the structure in which you start with the poem so the reader actually reads the poem, mm. the whole poem, mm. and then you go on to mm. the other material, as it were. But the relationship between your discussion of the poems and the biography, this is not, it's an observation which will lead to a question about mm. how you did it. Yeah. Um, means that... Um, the poems are arranged chronologically with one exception. Mm. Bright Star is actually placed 
in a different place to where it comes chronologically. Uh, well, that's because I wanted to talk about <laughs> Fanny Braun I, at that point. I, I absolutely <laughs> understand why you did that. <laughs> um, so I'm not complaining. It, it was a very neat <laughs> and uh, ingenious way of get, getting past, as it were, your uh, announced uh, programme. However, um, the move from the poem into the biography is interestingly structured in that when you get to the Ode to a Nightingale and the Grecian Urn, only at that point do these, these poems, both written in 1819, mm. do we learn about Charles Brown um, or Hayden who Keats actually met in 1816 and 1817. Now, that seems to me an ingenious and clever way of, um, as it were, bringing them in. This is the right place for them to come, but it's, a very, it's sort of... Well, a, a you're, you're quite right. I had to use quite a bit of sleight of hand because I felt that, um, yeah, I mean, so, of course, when I do bring in... Um, Benjamin Robert Hayden, whom, in fact, Keats had known for quite some time. I do look back and say, oh, well, he did first meet him in whenever it was, and I do go back a little bit into their relationship. I think that I had to keep a balance between the chronological linear narrative and treating each chapter in a much more essayistic fashion, which meant that I could be a lot more loose about things like that. And so, for example, I mean, it doesn't, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's a bit sort of random, and I, and I just hope that it works. So that's what I meant by being conversational. So the chapter in which I talk a lot about Keats's letters, because I actually wanted to talk about Keats as a letter writer, but that isn't, so, rather than just use the letters for biographical evidence in chronological order. So the chapter in which I talk about those is the chapter that begins with La Belle Dame Sans Merci, and the reason I do that is because the text of La Belle Belle Dame Sans Merci is first, the, the original draft of it first pops up in a letter to Keats's brother, and that gives me an excuse to talk about letters. So, I mean, it is a bit, there's a bit of cheating going on, and all I can hope in that sense is that I sort of smoothed over the transitions um, in a way that the reader, I just didn't want the reader to feel jolted. Well, actually, that fits in with your own point about wishing to have a conversational style. Yes. This conversation, after all, allows for digressions. Exactly. So there's quite a bit of digression in here. And to be frank, don't you think Keats's letters, especially those astonishing letters that go on for sort of 50 pages, I mean, they are masterpieces of digression. And I just really want to urge anybody here who hasn't recently read Keats's letters just to go and read them. Yes. This just happens to lead on to something I wanted to ask you about, Lucasa, which is about friendship, which is something that preoccupies me very much as a mm. biographer, thinking about how you write friendship in yeah. biography, because it's a very different thing from love and marriage and yes. professional relationships. And there's a, with Keats, of course, because of the letters, and because so many of the letters are to friends, and so much of what we know about him yes. comes from the yes. letters, it's fantastically important. But you're yes. very interesting about friendship in this book, because you call, you talk about how restless he was as a friend and how he moved on. And yes. you talk about um, how his friends kind of competed over him. Uh, but yes. Brown trying to take be proprietary about O.T. Yes. Nightingale, for instance. Yes. And then, of course, after he dies, he's kind of, the, the body parts are sorted out between the friends in terms, uh, as a metaphor in terms of yeah. his afterlife. So, yeah. the, so yeah. we get him through the friends very often. So I just wanted to know what you thought about that whole theme of friendship and how important that well, was. Well, I mean, I think the thing that I, I'm most struck by... Um, is the fact that he was only 25 when he died. And if you think of all your relationships with your friends that you had only in your early 20s, um, you know, I, I think, you know, there are certain sort of friendships that may seem to sort of, you know, 
tail off a bit or whatever that you know maybe if Keats had lived to be 60 he would have been you know would have gone back to a very very solid friendship with somebody that he'd that he'd known when he was young and that's what and again that's one of the things that I find utterly moving I mean I'm thinking of um, the, the, the fact that so many of his friends lived into such incredible old age and Keats is dead at 25 and the others grow up to be these you know Victorian gentlemen, um, elderly Victorian gentlemen, Joseph Seven, for example. Um, that I found incredibly touching. I mean, I'm slightly sort of digressing from your question about friendship, but I, again, I, I wonder whether I would have written a very different book on Keats when I was young. Because, of course, he died at an age not much older than my son, I'm sort of, you know, um, and I, and, you know, women who met Keats in real life did tend to have quite often, quite a maternal response to him. I, you know, and I did, part of me did feel a bit like that. <laughs> Absolutely. This is the only. I think this is the only book I've written where I've used the first person pronoun, and and I, and I think again that was to do that. The freedom to do that was partly to do with the pandemic, with the lockdown. Also, I think because fashions in life writing have changed, and the subjective and the anecdotal are much more um, accepted. In fact, you know, for some people, probably quite de rigueur and um and you know when i feel that i feel very strongly that you know well as long as you maintain um scholarly accuracy in terms of your documentation you know i think that's all great i just it just mustn't sort of substitute for it we have time for just one more question um this follows um I think on the both the question of, of the structure of po poems leading to the to the chapters, and then also the sort of question about the lyric subject from before, um, you you repeated a few times this idea of uh, reembodying the poems, mm. which I, this is really beautiful phrase. But so, uh, like embodiment um, for me makes me think so much of I, I guess for me as an American, like post war sort of. Um, uh, really embodied poetics in in America, at yeah. least uh, Charles Olson and things like this, um, and and so it's it was confusing to me that phrase reembodying right. the poem with someone like Keats when you're what you say is true so much of it is this sort of flutter back and yes. forth between yes. body yes. and abstraction, and so I, I wonder I mean this is a big question but I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about that and what you saw as the sort of actual biography how that came to embody the poem in some way, or if you could just speak a little bit more about that. About the, the idea of embodiment. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't, it strikes me that the, the idea of re and I don't mean to take over, well, I, I want to hear I what think, you say. I think it's yeah. a, well, I mean, I think it's an idea that I'm using in the book, partly as a metaphor, part, I mean, I'm using it in probably in more than one different way. I'm using it as a sort of this idea this word embodiment almost as a sort of heuristic word that will enable me to find different ways of looking at Keats. So to begin with, the first, um, uh, you know, one of the things that I really, really sort of began to think about when I was first writing the book was in Keats's letters. The, you know, the way in which he talks about his physical bodily experiences um, in a way that, you know, very few other you know, literary letters do. I mean, when he's talking about eating an, you know, eating a nectarine, or um, drinking claret, or um, and and so it was this awareness of his, in a literal sense, the fact that he's very physically aware of his own body. Um, as I said, also as a medic, he has an intimacy with human bodies. It, it, you know, in in a sense that no other poet I know of had, um, and then I'm using it possibly in a more metaphorical way to talk about this type of writing. I'm, I'm interested in what you say about the post-war American poets because it's not. Um, I'm afraid that they're not something that I'm familiar with. But yeah, yeah. How 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 are how are they using the phrase embodied? Um, for them, um, 
it's it's the breath of the poet is a liter the poem is literally an extension of the of the of the breath of the poet and of the body in a certain way um, um, that the typewriter the typewriter as a physical object acts as a sort of transition to right for me I think I, you I, mean, I, I, you mean I totally and I totally get your I, get, I don't mean to be I, I totally get what you're saying about Keats's body and drinking the claret and the and the yeah. medical stuff that that is so awesome I think that that makes a lot of, a lot of sense. But I think where I get confused about the way that you're talking about embodying is how that translates into, into re-embodying the poem itself. You, does, I mean, I understand... Oh, I'm mean. just using the word as a sort of... I'm just using the word as a sort of I, metaphor in the sense that, you know, I, 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 mean, I mean sort of recontextualizing it. In that sense, I, I mean, I was just using the idea of a poem that's sort of ripped out of its context and put in an, an anthology um, and now I'm putting it back in the context of Keats's life. So you know, that was just me ma me making a sort of silly writerly sort of um, <laughs> rhetorical I don't, I don't, thing. No, and thank you for inspiring a, 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 that. So, yeah. Okay, just one quick word, then I'm going to hand over to Hermione to to, to, to close. Um, I was thinking this when you were. Did you take the mic? Yeah. I was thinking this on this question of embodiment and putting the poem back into into the sensorium. Um, when Keats in um, Ode to Nightingale is, the, um, is talking about uh, the beak of the warm south and flora, how he moves between senses, he, the visual, the olfactory, the 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 body it's, it's i mean you know i i i i thought in 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 what you shared with us lucasta you captured that beautifully but i'm not going to hand over and the mic thank oh you have you. the mic thank wonderful thank you Hermione. i did no thank you elica for 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 sharing so so beautifully um one of the fascinating things about your book lucasta is the way it deals with the with what is such a gripping subject for all biographers, however they do it, which is the afterlife and the question of the afterlife. And there's some wonderful stuff, which we perhaps, you know, there's so many things to talk about, but the mythologizing of Keats and the way you touched on it at the beginning, the way people had turned him into a more romantic, even sentimental figure. I mean, you include the, the picture of se the picture by seven, the sort of posthumous picture where Keats is sort of arranged listening to a nightingale in a kind of tremendously spiritual, and lovable way and, and you're going mm, up to a point you know and so the way you deal with all these different kind of afterlives which come very much out of what happened to papers you know who edited him when did Keats's letters to Fanny Braun see the light of day and you pay a very honorable tribute in the book and here tonight to all those editors and writers and and scholars who have made it possible for people like us to write to write biography but i think your book joins this astonishingly rich and complicated and various kind of afterlife of of Keats i think it will now be built into that afterlife and it will be a touchstone for people to to come back to so we thank you for that and we also thank you for this wonderfully generous and candid um presentation um and i'm sorry you had to struggle with the mic but all was well in the end and thank you so much thank you, thank you.